at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA Hi everyone, CDM today. Uh, welcome to this week's XY Live. Uh, today we're doing a, a forum chat uh, and we've got a very special guest with us, uh, Ben Martian from, from the FPA, who heads up all the super exciting, uh, super complicated uh, regulatory and, uh, and policy position uh, standpoint. So, um, Thanks for joining us, Ben. It's, it's great to great to have you here as well. Thanks for uh, having me, Ben. Our pleasure. Uh, and and uh, just a, a big thanks to uh, to our friends at AIA for uh, for supporting the XY live sessions as well. So look, today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, regulation and, and and policy, and we. In the in the context of how you know how we can improve advice, I think you know uh, regulation is a, is a very tricky sort of area. Uh, I think most people would agree that it's absolutely necessary, uh, but at the same time, I think a lot of people think that there are uh, things that could be done better or differently. Uh, you know, to to improve the the outcomes for their clients and for, for their business as well. So. Um, for anyone that's watching in as well, uh, I'd love for you to get involved. So if you've got any questions, uh, any ideas, any you want to put up answers to any of these questions uh, to discuss, please uh, feel free to just shoot them into the chat box uh, on the side there. If you've got questions, we'll get to those as we, as we go through as well. So uh, so we, yeah, we'd love to we'd love to get your thoughts on on these points as well. Uh, cool. So, look, uh, the first question I want to ask, and I'm going to ask each of the guys uh, on the line. We've, today we've got uh, Clayton Daniel, entrepreneur extraordinaire and uh, the author of the, the amazing Fun Your Ideal Lifestyle. Uh, available, available at Amazon right now. <laughs> uh, we've got Adrian Patty, uh, claimed financial advisor and, uh, and, and business owner of a number of uh, a multitude of, of businesses. Uh, some some operating uh, inside regulatory guidelines and some questionably not. And uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've also got Phil Thompson, uh, who everyone knows who, who Phil is, and, uh, you know, he's from Melbourne, but don't hold it against him. <laughs> so, gentlemen, uh, as I said, I'd love to hear uh, from each of you on this one. Um, first question I want to ask is, if, uh, if you had a magic wand and could, could change one thing that would make advice better, what would that be? I'll go, I'll go to you first, Clay. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a really easy question. APLs, get rid of them. Uh, I just cannot think for one reason why we need an APL. If something is registered you know, and governed by ASIC, why do we need a secondary layer from a dealer group to say what's good and what's not? Uh, at the end of the day, an SOA is simply a bunch of words used to get away with recommending whatever that deal group wants product to be sold. So if we got rid of APLs, um, even with all the fancy wording in an SOA, you, you still wouldn't be able to get funneled down any particular product route. And what do you say then to just playing devil's advocate for, for a moment, uh, what do you say to the argument that APLs provide a a, a quality control standard to ensure that you know the advisors are only part of recommending solutions that passes past certain criteria. Yeah, I'd suggest that that argument's bullshit. So, <laughs> always interesting hearing your thoughts, Clayton. Uh, but you know, surely there must be some level of quality control that, that's required, right? If you look at some of the products that have been out there or strategies, things like, you know, Storm Financial, um, you know, and various other... Within the legislation at the time, like, the, just because something is 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 fine, and, and that's my problem with, with SOAs, you can make anything seem compliant. Um, APL, sure. So the argument that um, APLs are this awesome oversight that allows only great products to be used. I mean, why can't there be 
a, a universal answer to that question. Why does that change between dealer groups? You know, what? how can something be horrible here and then great there? It should just be universal. It should be one standard. And if it gets through that layer of, of, um, of due diligence, which I agree, it, there does need to be that layer of due diligence, but it should be standard across the industry, not individual uh, deal group. Yeah, good point. And look, I, I, I do tend to agree as well. I think that's that's one way that, you know, can, can influence the outcomes uh, for clients. So, But I, I do also think that, as you say, there needs to be some standard because ensuring that, you know, that there is a level of quality that's there and, and you know, especially the smaller advice practices, it can be difficult to, to sort of do all of that that stuff in house. So yep. thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, Mr. Paddy, what, what would you do with your magic wand? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, what a way to get yourself in trouble if you say the wrong things in this. Um, <laughs> isn't it nice not having um, a licensee, Clayton, um, to, <laughs> to be concerned about what you say publicly? Um, I, 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 I guess I don't really consider APLs at all when you when you're making a decision um, I'm just I could just see Phil coming up with his um, arguments I'm um, just trying not to give him too much ammunition um, I I think they've got a place I think um, Peter Bowman's just raised the um, agribusiness disaster piece um, you could argue that that's actually like and, and from Clay's standpoint like that's actually the government's responsibility to to filter that out at a base level as opposed to actually so anything like that. Um, another thing around the, the agribusiness piece, um, the biggest the biggest change in legislation over the last few years was the commissions being taken out of investments. So agribusiness was paying 10% commissions or, or up to it. Um, and there was huge tax incentives. So there's all these things coinciding to, it wasn't, yeah, I don't know if an APL really would have made a difference with um, adrian if i can just redirect for a second uh so let me ask you this way perhaps more directly if you had a magic wand that could change one thing about the industry to make it better what would that thing be get rid of soas <laughs> i just think they they just get in the way of advice Okay, and what's the what's the solution if there's there's no SOAs? What does that look like? It's like um, I'll I'll uh, bring in Mark Twain here. Um, I didn't have time to write you a um, a short note, so I wrote you a long note. Paraphrase that one. Um, essentially, that um, when you're writing anything, if you can get what you want to say into a shorter, condensed version that's understandable. Um, it's usually more concise, easy to understand and effective than just filling up pages and pages of crap. And uh, I've been going through this process with um, preparing for my advisor innovation presentation tomorrow. <laughs> There's been a lot of revisions. Um, but you can just fill stuff up and it doesn't, it's not adding much value to the client experience and the advisor experience. So that's my take on that. So I might, I, I think that's a really good point and I, I, might, I might direct that one uh, partly to Ben as well, because I think you know the, the ASIC have provided standards as to what a, what a statement of advice should look like, and and part of the part of those standards suggests that there is a, that it should be concise and it should be easy to understand. And I know uh, the FBA, I'm sure it would probably still be there, but I looked a while back, and they've got a guideline as to you know a framework for a statement of advice as as an example. Um, there are, I think that the AFA has also got a, uh, a framework for, for what an SOA should look like. Uh, I know that certain dealer groups, uh, like I used to be licensed with Synchron and they, they were really big on ensuring that their statements of advice were very condensed and they did that, uh, quite effectively. But I've also been licensed with companies where we had 150 page statements of advice that were so dense that, you know, most people would. Like I had literally had people that would, would pay and I know that they're not paying just for the statement of advice, but they wouldn't even take it with them because they, they did that, you know, it's, it's, it's too much and they've got no real hope of understanding it. So what's the solution? Because I know a lot of people uh, don't have access to, to, or don't use these shorter SOAs in practice. 
So should, you know, should there be some sort of obligation on licensees to ensure that they're not just, you know, adding additional disclosures after disclosures to, to you know, protect themselves, but resulting in a document that's so complex that, you know, people don't, don't understand it, Ben? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head there with my issues with SOAs, um, and I certainly have significant issues with SOAs. Number one, it doesn't have to be a document. There's nothing in the law that says it needs to actually be a document. There are certain requirements about what needs to be included in a statement of advice, but um, I think everybody's wedded to your A4 page style document for, for no particular good reason. I think there's a lot of um, innovative ways that you can show clients the advice that you're providing them without without being wedded to 150 pages. I'm not surprised somebody doesn't want to take 150 pages. It'd be heavy to start with. Um, and it would be boring and it would put you to sleep. We, um, when I was was um, still with the licensee, we were experimenting with using infographics basically to provide the advice diagram, each step of the advice, and then um, building explanations out from that where the client wanted more details. You could go to fact sheets, you could go to videos, you could... It was a lot more dynamic for the client. Um, unfortunately, because of, of the technology we're using, it it was still paper based at that point. But the idea was to transition it to web apps, um, video, just make it a lot more real and make it a lot more understandable. So I agree, SOAs in their current form are an issue. Um, I, I'm really interested in what ASIC puts out in, in the short term with their uh, SOA project they're doing around life insurance, um, which shouldn't be taken as just being for life insurance. It, it will be applicable to everything. It's just focused on life insurance. Um, and I'm excited to see what we see in the future. But don't be wedded to, don't be wedded to word-based, document-based, based ways. Do interesting stuff. But what should advisors do, though, for the ones that are sort of constrained with the, their obligations under their licensees, that they don't really have the scope to, to turn around and say, oh, I'm going to deliver advice via an infographic, but they because they would fail their audit and they're told that they need to deliver this, you know, monstrosity of a document? That's the ultimate issue, right? So if, if you are tied to a licensee that has decided that for their legal safety purposes they're going to um they're going to impose that structure on you then then if you do want to do more innovative stuff then you know there are other licensees out there who are who are getting more innovative and are looking at other other options for delivery of soas and i think um in the fpa's view a professional financial planner should should first and foremost be making sure that they're delivering advice to the client that's easy to understand easy for the client to, to get engaged with and, and, and get excited about and want to implement. And um, if your licensee is not giving you the, the opportunity to, to provide that, start pushing back. You're the professional. You're, you're the one who's sitting with the client. You should be telling them what the client needs to be receiving. It shouldn't mm. be the department telling you. Are you saying that was not Ben? Beg your pardon? No? Is Ben saying we we're all being pussies? Yeah, I think he's saying to take which it'll take to the streets and uh, start a revolt. Yeah. I wouldn't. That's what I got out of it anyway. I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't have used those words, but, um, <laughs> but there, very much in the paraphrasing of XY advisor Ben. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, but I think there's definitely an opportunity if you see better things out there to go to your licensee and say, "Look, there's a better way to do it." I, I mean. I was basically in charge of the SOAs where I was and um, we we started looking for all sorts of different ways to, to provide informative, engaging advice to our clients. Um, and and I, I've left, obviously, but my understanding is they're starting to get there finally. Cool. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and Tomo, what are you, what are you doing with your magic wand? Mate, it's uh, we're fifteen minutes into the XY Live, and I haven't said a word. I'm almost almost there. <laughs> <laughs> so my magic wand is is actually gonna be helpful, unlike Clay's idea or, or Paddy's idea. Uh, 
Clay talks about APL, but that's not really the main issue. The main issue is uh, product providers and advice providers uh, are one in the same thing. My magic wand is you wouldn't have a product provider being a licensee. Like too, too often we have advice being the loss leader to push product. And that that's not a profession. That's not a way we should run our business as, as an industry. And, but that's how we've structured it where licensees own products as well, um, or licensees white label products or, you know, and, and there's almost, almost no licensee who isn't doing this as, as a second form of revenue because running a dealer group is very expensive and very hard and very competitive. So you've got someone who like an AMP who's going to, you know, buy back your clients at four times um, as opposed to, you know, a small independent licensee, how are they going to compete on, on price? And, and they are, you know, they're, they're different service offerings, but, but they do have to compete. So, you know, they've got to look at ways of, I know your product is so dramatic, Phil, that Ben just fell off his seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, so for me, that's my magic wand. Get rid of uh, the, the alignment between product providers and uh, advice licensees. And that'll solve APL issues because that's really an APL issue is the, the, uh, the, reason, the reason we have restricted APLs is because product providers have licensees and they want to push product. Yeah, I, I think my solution's better, um, mainly because I'm opening, uh, you know, competition and you're trying to come in and say, uh, no, product provider, you're not allowed to give advice. You're trying to create more regulations. I'm trying to remove them. That's the kind of guy I am. Yeah, but Clay, the, the issue is everyone has a standardized APL. That's fine. But but the 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 product providers of the world who still own licensees, are they going to just say fully open APL? We're not going to influence any of your decisions? They should. An APL makes very little difference because every advisor can recommend any product they want. Yeah, licensees may put roadblocks in front of an advisor to recommend whatever they want. But most advisors out there realize that they can recommend anything they want. They just need to, if it's not on the APL, they just need to go through an extra process. And that may be not worthwhile. So, what's going on? Oh, gee. Oh, like, what? Nashi. All right, he's, he's cut out. Well, what's, what's your right of reply, Mr. Martian? What do you, what do you say yeah, to yours, though? Well, I, I think Clayton's solution is already there. There is no legal requirement for an APL to exist. You just have to have a good basis for why the product you're recommending is appropriate for the client. And um, there's nothing in the law that says there should be an APL. I know PI insurers prefer to see the list of products that you've put through whatever filters you have within your licensee to say that's a, a product that's appropriate for the clients that uh, we're advising on. But there's no legal requirement for them to be there. Yeah. Well, so we, should make, we should make them illegal then. <laughs> so, Nash, right. you're back. We, we, you, just met, you just miss me and Clay having an argument for the first time ever. We never disagree on anything. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm sad to have missed that. But, look, Phil, to go back to, to your point there, though, in reality, that's that sounds like a, like a lovely suggestion to me. But... It, I, I, don't, I can't see how that would be possible given that the biggest product providers are also the biggest licensees. So how does that work when that's a, when one of the big banks or, you know, your AMP, they, they're saying, well, they, they want to provide this service to their, you know, as part of their business model or whatever. Um, but they also happen to, to be hugely involved in the, in the manufacture of products. So is that just a, just a like, you know, that would be a great thing, but I know it's never going to happen or... Um, um, work in practice well two things you did give me a magic wand uh, but the second <laughs> thing banks are starting to look at moving out because regulations becoming tighter uh, you know, product pu pushing is becoming harder and harder so banks are looking at either moving out of advice or making advice standalone profitable um, which 
uh, is a good thing. You need you need a dealer group, a licensee on its own needs to be profitable. It shouldn't be built up on you know making a CBA shouldn't make a loss on CBA financial planning, but um, their Cominsure or, or CFS or, or any of their product providers, you know, making money off the back of that. Um, yeah. So in terms of practicality, how's, how's it going to work out? Well, it's, it's already starting. Um, but, yeah, it, I guess it is kind of a, a dream. Um, and as Clay mentioned, the biggest issue with it is that you're reducing competition in the market, um, which means that fees will just go right up. Um, but yeah. fees probably should go up. Like, it's, you know, it's relatively cheap for, for what... Uh, regulation's really high. So if we lower regulation... Um, make it easier to do business, then fees won't necessarily increase uh, because running a licensee will become easier. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and it's a market in that you can always choose to be self-licensed as well. So if dealer groups make their costs too expensive, more and more people just move to go down that, that path as well. Okay. And so, Ben, do you want to do you want to go with the magic wand as well? I'm sure you spend a lot of time thinking about this sort of stuff. Um. My one is I've got too many things I think to, to throw in there. Uh, my my main um, I, I would say that there is probably a framework in place at the moment for the profession of advice to, to move forward quite successfully. I think what people need, what planners need to be doing, is getting a lot more innovative with the way that they engage with their clients and the way that they provide advice to to their clients and. If we start doing that, then consumers will want to come to us and want to engage with us and want to get advice and get their dreams and, and hopes and financial positions put in a better way. So I guess the challenge I would be putting out there is, um, yes, there are some yes, there are some arguments we need to run with the regulators and, and with government to, to make sure that we've got the space to do what we need to do. But the challenge for everybody is how do we make advice more engaging? Um, what what tools do you need? What what ideas do you need? What what do you need the FPA to help get out of get things out of the way that can help you be really engaging with your clients and and, and give them world class service? Yeah, awesome, and I, I think that's a that's a great idea, and I love the you know making advice simpler and you know, using things like, you know, images and infographics to, to you know, increase that engagement with clients. Um, I think that that sort of bookends with what I was thinking about uh, when I was getting ready for today, you know, what I would do to, to change one thing as well. And it would probably start where, where before even getting yours, but I think that one of the issues with advice is that no one knows what advice is. Uh, consumers don't know, especially if you haven't had an advisor before and, I don't know how, and I you know, completely appreciate that it's difficult with the, you know, the, the differences between all different advice firms and how people do it. But you know, I think the Money Smart website is a great resource for you know different you know calculators, tools, and information. But I feel like the government or the you know or you guys or the associations and uh, could could have a, a help people understand what advice is and how it should work so that they can then they know themselves how to figure out what advice is good advice and what advice isn't good uh, because I think that would go a long way to to reducing you know some of the the issues that we've seen in advice and and it's often the things that uh, reduce that uh, consumer confidence as well so uh, just to understand the basic process how it works the things that they should be aware of uh, but I think that would go a long way then, then you come in with your engaging advice, and uh, you know, I think that I think that those together would would go a long way to uh, getting a lot more people into the into the advice and, and knowing when it is good for them as well. Ben, there was a topic that we talked about um, a while back. It came up on XY Advisor. I sort of threw you into it, which is about tax um, deductibility, and I guess um, pushing the limits of how that sits in terms of obviously it's an income earning um, endeavor usually for a tax deduction. And how, how, how much of a place do you think that plays in terms of helping advice get out there and be more um, accepted in the community? So I would, 
say, I, I don't think it will necessarily help with the cost of advice, but it will certainly make advice more attractive to consumers. Um, I don't like it, but consumers love negative gearing, right? Because they're getting a <laughs> They're getting yeah. a tax break. Um, whoever came up with negative gearing was was the biggest con artist that, that's ever existed, in my view. But um, but I think if if advice was seen as being tax deductible, then the same way that people can do their own tax returns, they go to accountants to get a tax deduction for for doing it. So I think it's probably a it's probably a way to get people more engaged with advice, but I don't think if the experience is still the same as what people are getting today um, and the way it's delivered is still the same, then I don't know that it'll actually move the needle too far. But we certainly are pushing very hard to get advice to be tax deductible because, um, and certain aspects of it certainly are today, um, you just have to do a hell of a lot of work to to to... to provide the client with the information they need to claim a tax deduction at the moment. And obviously upfront advice isn't tax deductible. Mm. We think it yeah. should be. I, I, would, I would agree on that as well. I, I think that uh, the, the advice should be, I know, you know, when I work with, with clients, um, you know, the, the co even the cost for, for initial advice, I can't understand why. And especially, you know, when you see that the results of the financial planning process and it, ends up putting people in a better position so they invest more money and, um, you know, effectively end up paying, you know, um, uh, setting themselves up for, for, you know, their investments for the future and reducing dependency on, you know, government in, entitlements that it just doesn't make sense that, the, that there is no deduction claimable for that, in, in my view at least. Uh, so... So... Next um yeah. So what I'd say is we're about to um, work with a few other associations on a big um, research project that, that tries to, again, better quantify advice and what advice can do for consumers and therefore we'll, we'll have that argument to take to the Productivity Commission. Should XY um, be a part of that conversation? Absolutely. We're happy for everybody to be part of that conversation and um, uh, that's what I'm here for today. Are associations working together now, are they? Associations associations always work together. Um, I I don't know how I don't know how um, much people look at what all the associations are doing, but we're all generally pulling in in the same direction. We often do consensus submissions to government. We often go together to government, and treasury, and regulators and work together. There's not really a lot of difference between the, the positions that all the different associations are pushing. There's nuances, um, but we have regular conversations with each other is the reality. We're, we're, we're always talking to know what's going on with everybody else. We, we do a lot of work together um, because if we're all pushing in the same direction, that's when, that's when we can get things changed. Great answer. Uh, okay, so next thing I want to talk about is... Uh, what are the roadblocks that you think are standing in the way of, of, uh, of building consumer trust in financial advice? I'll put it, I'll put it to you first, Paddy. What do you think we can do to build consumer trust? Well, what are the roadblocks? What's it, what's standing in the way and what, yeah, what if I, it's conversely, what, what could we do to increase the confidence in, in advice or increase the trust? Yeah, it's, I think a lot of the time it's the way advice can be communicated sometimes. Um, it's, I guess, really, um, and you, you start to see it with some of the people we have on XY Advisor, like just how they've been able to cut through to an audience and just be so relevant to them. And I think um, the challenge of how everything's been evolved, everything's evolved is that advisors aren't like a, to cut through, you're not just you're not the expert that knows everything. You're the you've got to actually be talking to the people, and I think that's that's what um, everyone's continually learning and getting better at. Um, and I think it's what it's really in the marketing space and how you actually communicate your value proposition to clients. And I think that's that's where everyone everyone has challenges. Um, like we all we all struggle with it from time to time. Ben, I think you're you're doing a really good job at nailing a target market. And, 
Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the biggest um, biggest challenges, like our own ability to communicate um, what we do and how we can help people um, and, and get it across to people when they've got so many different messages bombarding them um, regularly from like with social media, like there's just, there's so much going on these days and that's, uh, yeah, I think it's cutting through. That's probably one of the hardest, the biggest challenges. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Phil? Um, yeah, I think advice is a difficult uh, um, profession to gain trust um, because we are always looking forward in, in our advice. It's always forward looking. So um, it's difficult to really, especially investment, like if we're talking straight investment advice, you're always, you're not promising a return, but you're always looking forward saying, hey, I think this is the best product for your current circumstances. And that's how we've come from. That's, that's kind of the space that we've come out of. Or insurance saying, I promise you, if you do get injured, you're going to get paid out. And, you know, they may never get injured and may, may be paying thousands of dollars on a premium for their whole lifetime and never get paid out anything. So on top of the fact that our service offering is really expensive, it's not accessible to the masses. Um, for, you know, 95% of all advice businesses we charge a really high fee. So you look at other professions that have a high trust level like doctors or accountants, they've always um, dealt with everyone in the community. Um, and so, but we as financial advisors, we don't. So how do we, how do we build trust? It's, it's difficult, but we do need to have uh, low cost service offerings for the masses and not every business owner needs to run their own product or their own kind of service offering to, to reach a lot of people. Um, but in our current state, we don't have that um, one business really reaching the masses in terms of financial advice. Yeah, look, that's a good point. And I think that's something that we'll see, see more over time. You know, we obviously we had Ben Scully from Wealth Sherpa. Uh, in a little while back, talking about how they're, you know, providing those lower, lower cost, lower touch uh, service offerings. And my view is that, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of financial advisors I've heard complain about the fact that they, they can't service the client, or that this is why they need to get paid. I know in the, you know, when the debates were happening around insurance commissions, um, that was one of the arguments. But I think that the technology is there to support that these days. It just takes someone to to go and and create the offering and make it compelling and make it valuable for people. But I think that we'll certainly see that over the, over the coming years. Yeah. And I'd, I'd argue Acorns is a great example of someone who I, I would think have a really high trust level with their customers. Um, yeah. Low fee, low cost, really easy to deal with. Um, they're, they're a company that I think are, are really nailing that space in increasing trust in their company. Um, but, it, but how do we do that as a whole? Um, it's a difficult game we play. Yeah. Clay? Yeah, so there's two things. There's uh, the macro sort of industry-wide uh, problem of trust. Um, and I think how, yeah, that, that, that's going to be um, a decade-long or decades-long battle to, to move away uh, from our poor reputation that we've got where, where you know, we rank around the same level as politicians uh, you know, so there, there's there's that macro problem. The the good news is, however, a lot of advisors are on a on a micro level cutting through to their um, audience. So just because financial advice as a whole may be um, poorly trusted, you you've got some excellent examples, um, you know, such as you know. Um, there's many, many examples, right? So I, I just don't, I don't want to point someone out individually, but there are advisors that are doing really well in in doing, you know, getting involved with the community, being that name that people trust, and they're being a source of information. Um, and people like who they can get to know through a computer, you know, via GIFs and and PDFs and eBooks and and whatever. If they're a source of of knowledge, then it's very easy to go to them for advice. And so there might be a macro problem, but there are many examples of, of, of advisors doing a good job on a micro level. You've got three advisors on the panel. You couldn't just drop our names in there, Clay? <laughs> Mate, you know, like, I'll be sucking up too much. Come on now. 
Uh, and Ben, I know your your previous comments on the thing to improve, I think sort of sort of would would also go a long way to increasing the trust in advice. But uh, what do you think in terms of the roadblocks? Or I know you guys are out there asking questions like this at the moment. What are you hearing at the major roadblocks? So I, I don't know that there's a problem with um, trust in individual advisors. I think if you even look at ASIC data um, in some of the shadow shoppers, consumers who have a financial planner really, really trust their financial planner. It, mm. It's the others in the community who who hear the bad news story. So um, I mean, one of the one of the things that we've got going uh, to try and change the message and try and help with that message is our Money in Life website, where we're getting you, the financial planners, the, the experts in providing advice and improving clients' lives, to write stories and articles and, and get those good news stories out there. Um, and they're really starting to be picked up by the mainstream media and republished um, quite frequently. So. You know the issue is those good news stories haven't been written; that they weren't out there. Um, so, so we've we've created a website to to try and achieve that. Um, but I think that the biggest thing I would say is that we need to we need to stop fighting with each other. We need to stop arguing with each other. We need to stop the the tit for tat and the disrespect that we have for each other. And if we all come together and and talk about each other respectfully, work with each other respectfully, share with each other build a community of professionals, then then those right attitudes will start to get out there really quickly, which is, again, why um, I think this sort of community where you do have young, engaged, passionate people who want to be out there changing people's lives is, is so important and, um, and we think it's fantastic. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we see, see a lot, uh, well, we're seeing more and more is that sense of cooperation. I know I was reading an article the other day about talking about how, you know, people aren't networking, but uh, I'm not sure. I think that may have just been a media play, but from where I stand, it's, it seems that more and more people, are, uh, they just, they're happy to, to share their ideas. You know, we see it on our, the Facebook group that we've got that everyone's more than happy to help out with a question and, and share that knowledge. And I think, um, that's going to one increase the quality of advice, but then also yeah, increase the, the reduce the bashing and and, um, and have people you know uh, fit, fit, get get that you know higher level of trust as well. Uh, but I was just what, what, just got a comment from from Leon Jones just just on the the trust issue, just talking about the the discretionary uh, spend as well, and I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you guys have probably dealt with the same issue before, but um, I think that, you know, from from where I stand, people see it as discretionary, but when you can clearly, you know, really clearly articulate the value that you do provide, I think that uh, that helps with the discretion factor. But at the end of the day, I think it's difficult to avoid, uh, to avoid that because people, they just sometimes, they just strangely, you know, cut their costs and uh, we sort of suffer as well. Uh, so I just got a quick question. I'm just mindful of time because I do still have a, uh, a quite a few other points to get through. But um, quick question from Peter Bowman, who's watching in, asking if we want uh, if we want uh, and uh, if we'd be happy for an AFSL holder to uh, give up spending on things like conferences and uh, non-essential services and just provide a super low cost solution. Super quickly, Clay, you don't have a license, but. Yeah, look, I, I, there should be a low cost uh, option for, for every business, for sure. Adrian? I, I think it's a marketplace. So people generally have a choice. And if someone wants to offer a, a solution that does that, um, it could be a winner. Yeah. It's... Tomo? Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if there wasn't already a a dealer group out there who, who marketed themselves that way. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're probably right, but I would agree that it's the marketplace for me personally. I think I'm happy to go without that stuff from my licensee. If that means that I have to pay more money because I think there's so much stuff that that's happening out there these days that if you want to go to a conference or go to an event, you can go through an association, through a community an advice community or, or, 
or otherwise as well. Uh, cool. So I I wanted I've got a question, a comment here about uh, scoping advice, and I think that you know scoping advice is I think uh, is pretty much one of the worst things about financial advice. Although that being said, I don't know what the the solution is because sometimes it is absolutely necessary but personally i feel that scoping advice can be used as a way for advisors to effectively shirk their what should be their responsibility to provide advice in in certain areas uh and i feel that the resulting client outcomes are are not as uh as good as they they would otherwise be should it should the customer clearly understand the opportunities in other areas and then the advisor be able to appropriately uh, address those as well. So uh, I'm keen to get the thoughts of, of you guys and see, um, yeah, initial your views on scoping, but also to, you know, whether you think that there is a solution or um, a, a, a way that we can ensure that, you know, people's needs, you know, whether the, whether the advisor is the right advisor for them or not, uh, are covered and and in terms of whether advisors should be able to you know at w- what the standards should be also around advisor being able to say well i can advise on self-managed super funds even though i never do it or i can advise on direct shares but i don't do it uh as well so i'll uh i'll start with you tomo um yeah i think in terms of scoping uh I kind of think it's it's okay to scope. We kind of do it anyway. Like you think about, we talk about life insurance, but we don't do anything to do with general insurance. Um, we, you know, we talk about, you know, most, most advisors will talk about, you know, investments or, or you know, buying a house, but we don't do mortgage broking. Um, so we, we scope. Yeah, sure, we're not licensed to, to do mortgage broking, but we, we scope aspects of clients' financial lives anyway. So to go further down that rabbit hole and say, well, I only do insurance advice, I'm going to scope everything out. Um, as long as you've got um, a good system to refer those clients out if you see a need. Um, but, I mean, even then, we, we still, how many people refer out to a general insurance broker or have a great referral relationship with a mortgage broker? There wouldn't be a massive percentage. Um, and to say we need to be doing that um, is a big kind of burden on, on our business. Yeah, look, I suppose that what a, the reason that I get so annoyed with this, this, this scenario is that I see a lot of people... Uh, like in, in our business, we work with young people. Most of our clients are in, you know, late twenties and thirties, pretty much. Uh, and a lot of them, they, they, we're typically for probably for half that we're their first experience with seeing an advisor. For the other half, they might have seen one before. But for that other half who have seen an advisor in the past, it's often it might be with one of the big banks or um, or, or institutions, and they they will see, they see an advisor, but the advisor just wants to talk about life insurance or superannuation because they just do that sort of advice. This person is called a financial advisor and then, then that carries through to see that now they think that this is what financial advisors do. And I think that, that getting that message out that there are so many more things, that's the ones, you know, everyone's got a super fund and I think it's a, you know, a race to the bottom really. There's not so much difference between the funds that are out there these days. Uh, life insurance is... Yeah, you know, it's easy for an advisor to add value there, but certainly other things outside of that is where there's a lot of value around the strategy and the goal setting and the accountability and the planning process, as well as the investments and all of the other technical strategies that sit alongside it. And, you know, from my position, I see these people and they get turned off advice typically uh, because they think that it's just the, the an advisor is just going to want to talk to them about life insurance. But I don't know, like, perhaps, you know, blaming it all on scoping is not the, the right way, but... You know, I, I suppose you know how is it? How can we clearly articulate the, the specialty uh, areas for uh, for advisors and make it clear so that someone, a consumer, knows that when they see an advisor, what's what sort of advice they're going to get, or or how it how it works as well. Yeah, I, I I agree with you in terms of how to deliver advice. I'm I'm totally on board. That's exactly how I run my business. I want to uh, help understand the client's needs and, and help them with everything. Um, but it's it's difficult to say that every advisor needs to be providing holistic advice because it's just like 
it's just like me coming to you and saying, hey, you deal with young professionals, but, you know, their parents may need advice and you're not doing your job well enough unless you um, speak to their parents and, and offer a service to their parents. And, and how far reaching do we go in um, saying, well, you, you can't really scope out of certain areas. I, and I, I totally agree with you. I've had many clients come to me and say, I've had an advisor that just did super in insurance. And it's like, well, that's not really an advice. Like, you know, for me, and my understanding and what I truly believe, that's not really what an advisor should be doing. Um, that's just like ticking off some two products in, in a part of the advice. Um, so I, I agree with you, but how far do we go? Does every advisor need to be competent in every aspect of every client's financial affairs? We can have that. That's sort of what I was asking you. <laughs> yeah, but you don't do it, Ben. That's what I'm saying. You like, I, I, I don't think it's appropriate because it's just like saying you can't niche into one one area of your client's demographic because you're not doing them a, you're doing them a disservice by not helping their parents look after estate planning because that's going to impact your clients. So, you know, how you've you've effectively scoped out their parents um, from yeah. your advice process. Yeah, I agree. I just I refer them to Steve Nielsen because I know that he looks after them. Um, but but uh, what I'm getting at is that I know and good advisors do refer in those areas as well. But I think for the that's not practice not on mass. So Ben, I might get your thoughts because you you probably have a, a bit more insight to the to the technical side of things on this. But you know, is there another way that that we could get around this to make sure that it's clear to consumers what sort of you know what sort of advice is going to get they're going to get or what advice is typically covered by the person that they see and uh, how it all works from that end so I don't know that um, sorry firstly I'd say that uh, I think every piece of advice is scoped um, as Phil said um, the reality is we will consumers can't deal with um, a piece of advice that that helped them achieve everything in in one one fell swoop we, we need to stage it we need to do it over time and we need to agree with the client what's the most important things that we need to deal with today um, I dealt with retirees but I dealt with them in in the lead up to retirement and often the first two three four five years it was how do we maximize super but how do we pay off debts how do we put savings plans in place? How do we understand what uh, your spending is going to be like in retirement? What plans and, and helping them develop those plans? But the advice that we would ultimately give was around what they need to do with their super. Um, what I, so on what I would also say is I, I've looked at a lot of advice in my various roles. Scoping is generally about the worst bit of the advice process that I see done. Um, it is consume, the only way a consumer knows that the advice has been scoped in any way is often in this section in an SOA that's unclear and doesn't say what's in and what's out and often contradicts the advice that's actually being provided. Um, it, it, it's done terribly. So um, I think that is something that, that planners probably need to focus on. Um, how do I tell the consumer that and get agreement with the consumer and get them comfortable with this is what we're going to deal with in this engagement and, and over time we're going to build these other, these other things into your overall plan but this is your financial position, this is what you want to achieve over time and, and we'll get there, we just need to do it in, in bits and pieces but it's done terribly in my view. Yeah. So what do you think though? And I would agree with you, but what do you, uh, what do you think is, is the solution? Because I think, you know, I, I see, and this is why I started framing the question around scoping, but that it's, it's basically a, a cop out like with, no, I know, I understand that some things need to be scoped, uh, that, but I, I see it as a way that people, advisors can, can avoid, um, or they just focus on the areas that they want to focus on and, and exclude the other areas. And it, you know, especially you see com consumer and they're coming in and they're talking it, they're talking about setting up a financial plan. They don't understand the financial jargon. Then generally not not completely comfortable talking about all their money with someone they've just met. They're out of their element. They're sort of you know uh, not not in the strongest sort of position. And then 
you know, a lot of conversations are had and they end up agreeing to, it might be mentioned that uh, it's, perhaps it's not clear the implications of them agreeing to advice being scoped. Uh, but is disclosure the answer? More disclosure? Because I feel like we've got a lot of disclosure. Oh. Yeah, no, so, so no, it's absolutely not the answer. Um, I think... Uh, uh, I think we're in it. We're still because we're still a young profession. Um, we haven't we haven't necessarily found our niches. If you go to a GP, he will he won't be a specialist in anything, but he'll be able to help you identify what your issue may be um, and who you might need to go and see to actually actually help that. And I think there is absolutely a role for financial planners and financial counsellors um, to help clients set out what their financial dreams and hopes and objectives and, and goals are and get a, a really good understanding of, of, of what their entire financial position is. But then say someone over here is going to be your expert in super. Somebody over here is going to be your expert in life insurance. And I think over time, the profession will get to that. The problem we've got at the moment is that people don't know where to go as that starting point. And often they end up at the super expert and often they end up at the life insurance expert. And that person is comfortable giving that advice, is probably licensed to give advice, is an expert in that advice, and that's where they're comfortable. And so they do that piece of advice, but there's not the moving them around to to where they actually need to be. Um, and, and again, I think this that comes down to this trust and community issue that I, I spoke about earlier. If we're all working together, then it's easy to refer people to the, to the right people to get what they need. Um, yeah. If we're not, if, when, if we're... If we're siloed the way we are at the moment, then then that's where you get the, the poor outcomes. Nashi, I don't know if we've got time, but it might be interesting hearing from Clay because from memory, Clay, you scoped out insurance advice when you were in the dark ages when you were a planner. Is that right? Um, oh, for a little while. For a little while. But I, I mean... I never gave insurance advice. Yeah. yeah. It, it, in, in the end, I stopped, you know, I stopped giving it, yes. Um... It's, it's such a hard thing. Like, I totally get what you mean, Ben, in that it's used uh, as a way for people, for advisors not to do or, or just to focus on their one little way that they can get money. Um, but at the same time, like, how do you solve it? Literally, the only solution to that problem is for everyone to become an expert in everything. Um, and then disclosure obviously doesn't solve the problem either. So then... I guess no, so the, I just I don't think everybody does need to be an expert in everything. They need yeah, to be yeah. an expert in in understanding a, a client's finances. They don't have to be an expert in providing advice on everything. Yeah, yeah, which, which is definitely my point because it's it. So that's not a solution. Like it, that's way too too difficult, and and we we don't even see that in the medical profession. Um, so I think where what we'll probably see is. Um, the result being you have like a coach person who, who takes that GP role and then each technical thing will get outsourced to the technical boffins behind the scene, um, almost like, uh, like specialists that you send them to. And probably that'll be tech, right? Like probably within, certainly within 10 years, that'll just be automatic, right? So if someone walks in, you have a chat to them, you figure out what they want out of life, you figure out what bad, bad decisions they're doing, what path they're on, you get them to come over here. Oh, by the way, due to the conversations we've had, this is now done, there's your super and insurance, and then you know, there's your mortgage. And I think that'll probably just end up being tech and, and the person in the middle uh, will, will be that coach. I think that's probably the closest solution that I can think of. I, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I, I can absolutely see that's where we'll end up going is that is that financial planning, um, the financial planner will essentially be the, the coach or the hub in, in the middle of a wheel and um, all the spokes that are on the outside of the wheel will, will be outsourced to other experts or other professions or, or, or using technology. Yeah, I would love I'd love to, to see that and I think it's like you say it's hard to, to be a specialist in in, in all areas uh, as as well and I think technology will really help to to support that as well. 
Paddy, just uh, for the final comment on this point, I might just throw to you before we wrap it up, and we have gone a little over time. So, um, what are your what are your thoughts on this scoping, specialising? Yeah, it's it's a hard one. We 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 technically cover an advisor can cover. It's probably the broadest profession as that there is. Like you can't like medicine's been around. This is probably how medicine starts. I really like that analogy because. Um, they've managed over time, they've specialised, but like at the moment, we're across, and the legislation's putting it on us with best interest duty to be across everything. Like it's, even though there hasn't been much, um, I guess, um, enforcement around that space yet, there's still, it's still open architecture. Like the, the, the legal system hasn't had a chance to really get its teeth into anything yet around that space and it's not really defined. So at the moment we're sitting here with like, we can wear whatever hat we want within this really wide range. Um, and a lot of people are specializing and which forces them to scope things out. Um, a lot of people would like to keep things broad so they can cover those areas. But what the challenge that comes in there is the cost of doing that and the way that I guess uh, regulation forces so many cost layers when you want to do things in a modulized fashion, like you're alluding to, um, Ben. The like when you when you want to break up advice, which is the ideal way of sort of people consuming advice, so it's not so in your face. The way the way the cost of delivering advice and the documentation is designed, and the the compliance procedures it forces and incentivizes advisors to jam as much into a um, at the start as possible because it's just the cost of actually then doing that piecemeal is cost on the advisor and often they have to subsidize the cost to deliver that piecemeal to the client because it's just not because of the documentation and requirements there. So I think it's a cost thing. It's a lack of definition to, to what um, I guess uh, it's, it's a breadth of um, what we cover issue and um, it's just going to be something that plays out and Really, technology is one of the best things that's going to help us there. And I think that coach space and um, the centralised hub piece is, yeah, I agree. Totally. Can I just answer that quickly? I, I, I think I think part of the issue is that we undersell the value of the advice we're providing. I think unless we, for a lot of planners, unless they feel like they're giving five, six different solutions to, to the client's problems, they can't justify the, the 3000 or 5000 or $10,000 fee, the... the the value in advice is putting a plan in place with the client and and helping them achieve that over the long term. And I think we need to be a lot more comfortable with telling consumers that that is actually our value, not the solutions that we put in place at the end of the day. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think a, a very fitting way to wrap this up. Um, for everyone watching in, I know that the FPA are currently working on updating their 10 point plan, which they uh, basically, it's their, their 10, 10 points they want to uh, cover off with the regulators over over the coming years. They then tells me they ticked off pretty much nine and a half from their last plan that they put together. So if anyone's got any feedback, ideas, uh, suggestions that they that they have uh, or that they want to reach out about with the to the FBA, there's Ben's. I can see Ben's just put a his email in the in the contact tab. There is that the best way to to get in touch, Ben? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Through email at fpa at fpa .com .au. For any members that are listening um, in the member centre in the communities, we've got the the forums going on at the moment to have these discussions with other members. Um, but if anybody needs my help or, or wants my advice or, or, or tips, just yeah, send an email to fpa at fpa.com.au and um, attention me. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Ben, very much for joining us. It's great to, great to have you uh, sitting on the forum with us today. Uh, gentlemen, thank you also. Uh, very valuable insights. And Phil, I can't believe you agreed with me. I think that's the first time that happened. Uh, but that was really nice. That was a highlight for me. Uh, guys, next week we've got um, we've got another XY uh, XY Live with uh, with Brian Kenner, who he is amazingly gets a seventy eight percent referral rate inside uh, his business from his clients, and we're going to talk to him about how he does that. So I think that's going to be a really good uh, chat. Feel free to join us and uh, the register 
Jackie has just put the registration link up there as well. Uh, if you also, if you're not on the Facebook group, uh, you should uh, get involved uh, ASAP because there's some awesome conversations happening in there as well. Thanks again to AIA for uh, for helping us out with this event, uh, and yeah, look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. See you guys.